poetry of the brain. And that most particularly appeals to me because brains, in fact, are not really logical devices. They're quite illogical. We are very poor at doing logic in comparison to many other things that we can and do excel at. And what I'd like to do is to start off to show you some of the experience that I've had, what I see when I look at brain activity. Because the kinds of activity that I view are not those uh, binary digits. They're not those that can be readily rendered into logic gates and Boolean algebra. But instead, uh, rather wicked looking, noisy and trashy kinds of dynamics. And it really is baffling how to deal with this kind of, uh, of um, misinformation. a physiologist named Fleuron, who was very interested in the modifiability, the flexibility of cortex. And he conceived cortex as this general purpose organ for intelligence. Among other things he did was to operate on pigeons and to reverse the tendons on the flight muscles so that the muscle for lifting the wing was replaced with a tendon that depressed it, and vice versa for the depressor. And showed that given an opportunity of a, a few weeks of experience, training after surgery, these birds learned how to fly again. Another example was uh, Hans Luke Teuber at MIT, who invented a type of inverting prism with lenses for the eyes, which would turn the world upside down. And he divided his subjects into two groups. One group would sit in a wheelchair and be pushed around, and the other would do the pushing. And he demonstrated that the ones doing the pushing could, in fact, very quickly learn to get around, to operate in this upside down world quite effectively. In fact, his star pupil learned to ride his motorcycle in Cambridge traffic with these inverting prisms. And as he drove along, he could flip them up and then drive a little further, he could flip them down, showing this remarkable attitude of his cortex to the outside world. The ones in the wheelchairs didn't learn anything, which is an important lesson uh, that brains operate primarily by reaching out into the environment, making predictions, futurists, about what is going to happen as the result of their own actions, and then testing the sensory input, which is the result of their actions, not the reverse, which is the classic stimulus response, response paradigm of the localizationists. 
Well, this has now been followed by a number of engineering successes, which are quite dramatic, of sensory substitution, as it's called. And it is remarkable now, not only how little information will suffice from one of these artificial arrays of electrode or of sensors of one kind or another to generate an input which the cortex can very quickly learn to replace the missing organ. One of the most successful demonstrations of this by Paul Bakirita is a device which essentially consists of a little wafer that he puts on the surface of his tongue. The tongue is a wonderful place to put input in to the, uh, to the central nervous system, bypassing some missing organ. And in his case, it's the loss of his vestibular apparatus sense of balance. Well, that loss now means that he can't get up out of a chair without holding on to get around the room. When he puts this device into his mouth, this wafer, with a little uh, collection of wires into a, uh, a pouch on his, his waist, that little wafer also has in it a, an accelerometer in two dimensions which now senses for him what the vestibular apparatus used to. And this input then delivered to his tongue is the replacement of the information that he needs coming now through his 
sensory motor system and not through the vestibular aspect uh, uh, controls for his his uh, balance. Well, that's an illustration of not only the adaptiveness of the cortex, but the potentiality for one cortex to replace another. There are other experiments, which I won't go into in detail, in which auditory input has been replaced by tactile input and visual input has been replaced by either tactile or auditory input, indicating now that for the navigation, the, the orientation, the ability to read, the ability uh, to understand speech, there's a remarkable flexibility which is largely, has been largely untapped and which is now just unfolding. These are fascinating engineering developments. And perhaps most significant is my belief that brains, as I said, are not logical systems. They're very poor at logic. They're dynamical systems. And they have this capacity then for fresh creation. We demonstrate this in all of the senses in the following way. We give a stimulus which is accompanied by a reward. If you don't make a stimulus significant for an animal, then you don't get any of these interesting spatial patterns. The animal simply screens it out. That's the most important things that brains do, is getting rid of massive quantities of information. We present the stimulus and show that on repeated trials, we can define a particular spatial pattern, which is unique to the animal and unique to the odor. and is different from another type of odor which the animal is trained not to respond to selectively. So we have the rewarded stimulus and the unrewarded stimulus, the animals making a discrimination, and we can show that these patterns differ. Now we simply switch the reward from one to the other, and both those patterns change. So that the whole Science of neural representation is, by this technique, disproven. 
Furthermore, we have to ask where do these patterns come from? They are created with each inhalation, each time the animal takes a breath. And the result in is that what the animal knows is only that which it's created within itself. It knows what expectations it has, and it knows the results of its tests. Or to put it another way, brains are continually engaged in creating hypotheses and testing them. And all they can know is what did they hypothesize and what was the result of the test when they did that. Brains are, in fact, engaged in predicting the future, that they are inventing the future continually and testing it to determine the reliability, the value of their tests, and changing, adapting, accommodating to the results of their testing. This is what philosophers call the action perception cycle. And essentially, it's on the way to replacing the stimulus response, the reflex model, which has driven neurobiology for the last 150 years. Well, that's essentially all I want to Oh, except I do want to acknowledge my uh, co-workers. Linda Rogers, unfortunately, was killed in an auto accident about three years ago. And I'm very sad about that. But Mark, you're in there. <laughs> so I, uh, I think this is all really I want to say in terms of you know, the background of, of my, uh, my uh, uh, statement, if you like, to futurists that that's what you're engaged in. Are you not? <laughs> yes, please. From what I'm hearing from, from you and other people who are actually studying the brain is that there's three elements. Uh, there's prediction, there's visualization, and there's action in the world. Uh, is that a fair uh, evaluation? Yeah, it'll do. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, What's your question? Well, so, well, basically, I wonder if you could elaborate on that, that, that that's really what's going on, is that you have to visualize, but you also ha have to be able to act in the world in order to make it work. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, there's, a, there's two questions here, uh, and I'll try and deal with them one at a time. In the first place, of um, computation, you know, of, of using a language. The uh, uh, last book that John von Neumann wrote, the Computer in the Brain was published posthumously. He was killed by an osteosarcoma before he could finish it. But in there, in the latter pages, he writes that he doesn't know what the language of the brain is, but he knows that it's not mathematics. And the reason he knows that is that brains lack the arithmetic and logical depth that characterizes computers. In other words, the long multiple chains of computation with minimization of round-off errors, brains are totally incompetent at that kind of, of um, operation. So he says that it's not mathematics, and I think that what he should have said, it's not a language of any kind. Brains essentially are dynamical systems, and we use language to describe them. We use mathematics, we use differential equations, we use Percolation theory, we use probability distributions to describe how they work, and we can model them in terms of numerical techniques for integration to solve these equations. I would disallow that the use of Boolean algebra is a model of, of what 
brains are actually working with. I would say that brains do it. They obviously invented it. But that uh, that's not a description of how they do Boolean algebra. So that's my answer to your question about is there a language of the brain. I would say there isn't any. There's no code. And a fair number of my colleagues agree with me on this, though I have to say most do not. They're looking for the code of the brain. Now, what was your other question? And then the, the fact that there has to be a component of action in the oh, world. Yeah, in yeah. This uh, goes back to Aristotle in his disagreement with Plato. Plato described perception essentially as a passive process. And in fact, his model, you recall, was the cave where the troglodytes, the dwellers in the cave, can't see outside. All they can see is shadows cast on the wall, but the light's coming from outside. Now, Aristotle said that perception is active, that it's a matter of reaching out into the world and cutting, shaping, burning, and finding out about the world by this process of taking action. And what he described then was the importing of the forms, leaving the material behind, and storing those and processing those. Well, this image of the, what we now call information processing was discarded by Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, 700 years ago. He came up with this notion that Brains are, in fact, probing out into the world, and that's where we get the word intention from. It means thrusting forth, pushing out. And now there is the impact of the senses as a result of this action. And he analogized this now not to a cave, but to a tent. And the light's not coming from outside, it's coming from inside. And he described this as pushing against the walls of the tent and studying or seeing the changes which occur as a result of these actions, but with nothing coming across the barrier. Now that fits very well with my picture of how the brain acts into the world, provokes the sources of energy which come back onto the senses, impact on them, and then the impact essentially selects a basin of attraction in an attractor landscape, one of a range of possibilities, potentia, which are set forth by the brain as possible outcomes of a given action, and the impact now 
selects which of those is the valid response. So that's now called the action perception cycle or the action perception accommodation cycle according to Piaget. So yeah, I think that's a key to understanding how, uh, how our brains are, are doing what they do. I mean, the, the problem, as I understand it from our chief scientists, is that there's too much information on, on the periphery and that the pulse modularity of the, that with which, by which the information is sent back to the neural channel is simply not sufficient, at least theoretically, to pass all that information that the eye is capturing back to the brain. And so I'm just wondering if that's a condition that extends to other peripherals um, or... or Yes. Uh, like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, uh, the striking thing is that, that uh, uh, this sensory information coming in from the receptors and from the, uh, the retina, which is actually a part of the brain, but uh, from this standpoint, it's peripheral, that you have this massive inflow of information, all these action potentials, particularly in the skin and the olfactory system, because these receptors don't adapt. They'll put out what's ever there, and that's important. But the selection process in, in the sensory cortex, the first cortex that it comes to, and this now is because the cortex has put up this uh, landscape of chaotic attractors, and this is like uh, imaging uh, uh, the craters on the moon, and you're shooting a ball there. It's going to fall into one of those craters, going to roll to the bottom, <coughs> meaning it'll converge to the attractor. Now, in the process of doing that, <coughs> it's lost all the information as to where it hit in the crater. All that counts is which crater it fell into, and the information about where is lost. It's unimportant. It's thrown away. So here you have already a major reduction. But there's a further reduction in that what is reported out is which crater, which attractor, was at which class does this thing belong to? And this now is an enormous reduction in the input of information to the rest of the, the brain. In fact, you can say that virtually all the information has been thrown away once this choice or this selection has been made. I have a question. Uh, the announcement said a little bit about collective consciousness, and I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that, especially if there's anything you've learned that uh, suggests th things we could do that would increase our collective intelligence and wisdom. Yeah, I'll quote Nietzsche to you. He said, physicists and philosophers won't learn anything until they learn to dance. And the reason I say that is that you're raising the question, uh, essentially, of uh, shared knowledge. Now, what I've described is a process of learning by which an individual takes action into the world 
suffers the consequences, and then changes himself to learn from it. And this is a very individual kind of process. And what it leads to is a degree of isolation. I call this the graduate student syndrome, because graduate students learn more and more about less and less and wind up knowing everything about nothing. <laughs> and that isolates them. You see them working in their cubicle, and they don't talk to anybody. They've lost all human contact. It's a disease. Well, it's a model as well for the unbridled flow of learning, accumulating knowledge, without raising the question of sharing this knowledge or getting shared knowledge. With this perception cycle, it raises the question, how is shared knowledge possible at all? And my answer is that shared knowledge comes through shared action, that when you act together with another individual, then you have this common experience, coordinated experience. That's why dancing is such a good metaphor, because you predict what the other person's going to do, so they don't step on each other's toes. Uh, to my mind, the most obvious fact of the last three million years of human evolution is that the brain is an organ for socialization. And we're denying that exceedingly important capacity in favor of uh, an excess emphasis on individual achievement and learning. My main question is, um, I, was, I was very fascinated by your description of how information that comes in from the periphery is filtered, and you described it as these attractors or these craters that essentially take groups of data and, and collide them, and, I mean, collimate them. Um, but I'm wondering, wh how are those craters or those attractors created to, to begin with? Uh, if the activity is from a, an existing attractor, you only get reinforcement of that existing attractor, which is what you're describing as the, the reinforcement of what we already know. The essential feature is the introduction of a novel stimulus, something the animal's never seen before, that you want it to learn. Now, the essential feature is that the each cortex has not only this attractor landscape, one of those attractors is a kind of a wastebasket which says it doesn't fit with anything. And that tells the animal essentially that the, there's a stimulus there and it may be important, but we don't know what it is or what it means yet, but learn it. Now in that circumstance, this wastebasket puts out a really chaotic signal with no predictable pattern to it at all. This is the virtue of chaotic dynamics. And it effects what's called an orienting reflex, where the person or the animal stops, freezes, looks, listens. I mean, think if there's a loud bang outside, you know, you, my God, what was that? And then, if it turns out a little flash of lightning or something, or you see it's raining, then forget it. You screen it out. You don't listen to it anymore. But 
if you see smoke, if you see people running, man, that's a learning experience. That's novel. That hasn't happened here yet. It will. <laughs> <laughs> that's futurism for you. <laughs> but this now essentially creates activity which drives the heavy end synapses and which now forms new kinds of connection and forms a new basin of attraction, which essentially is a new story. So that's the first part of, to answer your question. The second part is how can you facilitate that? I don't know. Well, I'm thinking in terms of the action perception paradigm. How do you, what kind of action would precipitate the creation of these new practices? Yeah, I, that's, uh, I don't have a, uh, a physiological answer to that. Uh, I can only speak in terms of keeping an open mind. And how do you do that? You know, as I get older and older, I get <laughs> my mind is more and more closed. You don't know what kind of, you keep an open mind, you're not sure what's going to come in. <laughs> so I really uh, don't have a good answer to your question. I think it's an excellent question. Uh, maybe you have to think. You have to make new movements when you learn new things. If you actually begin to make new movements, then you can still learn new things. So increase the state of more learning. Hey, that's a good idea. Take up Tai Chi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that what he's saying? Yeah. yeah. So, no, essentially what he's, what he's asking for is, is how can you take advantage of this process by which new learning takes place, which you get a new category, something that's, that's different. And uh, uh, the obvious um, uh, feature of this is the invocation or induction of the orienting response where you are focusing, you're opening your, your attention, your mind to something that's there. You don't know what it is yet. And it's that process of opening up which has to be triggered by something that's strong enough to overcome the capture of the system by some pre-existing uh, uh, event. I would say what comes to mind is, is an example of uh, uh, the uh, early Native Americans who first saw what they thought were clouds coming in over the horizon. Well, they'd never seen a ship before and they couldn't conceive it. And so therefore, this information coming in of this white moving patches, they interpreted as a cloud. It fell in the wrong, it fell in an existing basin. 
And it wasn't until they began to have the experience of the bloody Spaniards that came out of the ships and were creating mayhem that uh, they were, their attention was captured. The orienting response was invoked. 